for coming out tonight. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the things we're really trying to do here is help facilitate some conversation, some thought about what our communities, how and how our communities will be interacting with our cars in the future. Just sort of thinking about um, the economic, social, ecological changes we might um, be facing. I think Jim put into the context there, we're going to see a lot of changes in uh, what the landscape we could, if the climate projections are correct, see a lot of changes in what, what our landscape looks like, how we interact with that landscape, what that means for um, the resources we rely on as a community. Uh, you know, we have the potential to see a lot of shift in our conifer species, moving in higher elevation or moss altogether. And then we're looking at potentially uh, some growth and expansion of past and, and oak. And so that could be a lot of changes. It could definitely impact your ski experience of the purgatory, for instance. <laughs> it might be mountain biking through the animal oak. Um, but to think that through a little bit more, and to have, I think, facilitate a little bit of a, a broader conversation around how our communities interact with that, we brought together what I, everybody refers to their panels as a scheme, but ours is truly a scheme. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, tonight we have up, uh, in front of you Mr. Jimbo Yogaru, he's with the San Juan Citizens Alliance, uh, doesn't often go by Mr. But, uh, and uh, he is the Lands and Forest Protection Manager for the San Juan Citizens Alliance and uh, participates in a lot of conversations uh, in collaborative groups and we really appreciate his presence. We also have J.R. Ford from the Pagosa uh, Forest Health Company over at Pagosa. J.R. has uh, been working to uh, develop an industry, a small industry around biomass the removal of small diameter wood from the San Juan National Forest, per, uh, right now primarily around Pagosa, moving more toward cloud chart usage of that, um, and aspirations for other avenues as well, potentially into the future. And then we have Amy Lochner, who's with the U.S. Forest Service, the Gunnison Office, correct? And she is an entomologist, and she works closely with Jim Warhol and has over the years. And next to her is Dan West, who's the Colorado State Forest Service entomologist. Uh, both Amy and Dan work on annual assessments and evaluations of beetle expansion and presence across the forest. And then Kara Chadwick, who is the forest supervisor on the San Juan National Forest and uh, started here in 2014. So this is four years. Four years. Four years as forest supervisor. And really, uh, so, managing the districts across the San Juan, from the Pagosa to the Columbine and over to the Dolores, and really there are different issues across all those different districts. And so, that would be an interesting uh, force, I would think, to be uh, maybe, uh, the supervisor of. Yes. And then we will have, we, we are going to allow you to participate in this as well, as questions arise, and if they relate to the, the topics that you presented. So, thank you, Jim. Everybody for being here. I really want this to be about a conversation. I'll kick it off with an initial question. We'll you know see how folks respond and then we'll bring it to you about the audience. Sound like a good evening? Yep. All right. Fantastic. So and I was just going to start, uh, you know, Jim did an excellent job of presenting the changes we may see in our landscape. And I was kind of wondering, are there any challenges, changes, or opportunities? to our local system that you see as part of the pa uh, panel here and from your uh, various perspectives for the San Juan National Forest. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, kind of kick this off. Um, from an entomology perspective, we have a unique um, kind of pine type. Certainly thinking back on kind of the Dolores County and thinking about um, kind of the San Juan lower elevation pine type. Um, being where we are, um, we're kind of at the northern range of several bark beetle species. We, in no other part of the Colorado, do we really see multiple bark beetle species that can kill a tree um, in one tree, other than here um, in this 
southern part. And that really poses a, an interesting situation here. It's really unique and a challenge. One, from a management perspective, we have beetles that are basically flying from March or April all the way through until November. And really, you know, if we're just dealing with, let's say, hypothetically, we're dealing with spruce beetles somewhere, we have a short window of time when those beetles are flying. Um, in our pine type down here, you know, we have a very long extended period, and that becomes a challenge when we're thinking about management and treatment and regimes of um, getting in there. When is our window to actually get a treatment done so that we're not actually creating uh, more of a, of a situation? So um, that's one of our certain challenges down here, is just dealing with just the pine type um, and trying to deal with some of the markets that we have down here around here, pine beetle, western pine beetle, mountain pine beetle, just as an example. I'll let it into somebody else. So I think Jim talked about some of the ways to address some of that, some of the challenges out there in um, the areas where we could actually keep species to manage and for resiliency. And that's um, what we've been focusing on is managing for, for resiliency. But the challenge there, of course, is um, finding markets. Because if we don't have a market, it costs us um, hundreds of dollars an acre to treat, to, to manage for resiliency. And, um, we have about 8,000 acres of ponderosa pine and dolores that need a treatment. I see opportunities there, though, um, for the future. Uh, we've been trying to manage our aspen, and um, we do have some markets for that. But, uh, so into the future, we're looking for markets. Anybody else? I think from an industry standpoint, I think there's a, an opportunity there. Uh, I broad buy-in and the modern supply in the one drive is to, um, it, it, what type of treatment that uh, the environmental groups and others would like to see. And I think that there's opportunity to go out and, since there's very little industry present in our area, to develop a you know, new model, a uh, more of a model that uh, not only do you uh, harvest the trees, but you also take the slash remove that and you should make other products. There's a lot of uh, different uh, products that are coming down the pipe that uh, we're just trying to uh, come up with that business model that works best for Southwest Colorado is really interesting, but I do think because of a lot of broad buying that there's turned out to be a the market side of it. It's just going to be because of lack of capital, it just takes a while to get there. Um, I have one. You can call me Mr. Baker if you want to. Yes. Um, well, I think it's evident from Jim's presentation and having spent a day in the field the other day with Ann and Amy, um, looking at beetles and et cetera, that the challenges are increasing, right? Um, challenges are increasing, and I think the unknown aspect of the future are also um, significant. So, um, to me, um, our organization that points to the fact that uh, um, there are these soft challenges and opportunities that we probably need to be a little smart, smarter and sharper than we were in the past. And um, I really think a key component to that, um, that's kind of some of the point that JR was pointing to, is you know, we need to find some uh, ways forward that are very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive, collaborative, and so forth. So, um, you know, I don't, you know, I, let's see how, how to put this. Um, you know, so I don't think, you know, there's no silver bullet for any of these things. So it's going to take some incredible combination, smart combination, on any forest, any bench type, to move forward on some of these pieces. So, um, when I see that, it's going to be the whole range. If you want to, you know, logging might be part of it, but if we're really looking towards resiliency and restoration, we have to consider the whole picture. So, um, for example, right now, this fork in the state, we have 150,000 or so slash pilots, right? Is this a problem? Yes. Okay, so somehow we weren't smart enough to approach that. I mean, there's a lot of challenges, right? But before we work ourselves into another corner like that, other corners that we worked ourselves in. We should probably work, uh, you know, slow down with some of these things, or at least communicate real well. 
look at all the science, of which there's new science coming out all the time, and to really find a way forward that's comprehensive and that um, really includes all the pieces here, the economic, the social, et cetera, pieces. So that's really, you know, our piece looking forward here is really this. Let's kind of look at the precautionary principle. That's not as being difficult enough as it is, right? Let's not mess it up further. Okay. Let's not end up with some other, um, you know, pieces that we didn't expect, like 150,000 slash files. That I was looking at slash files with Dan and Amy the other day, and heck, you know what's in slash files? Lots of young wheels. Okay. So that's not a place that we really need to go to, except for maybe with parents. So if we think kind of a comprehensive, all these different pieces, how the different players can uh, be part of the solution, I think that's really uh, the need for the future, and that's whole opportunities uh, in many ways as well. Great, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Sam? I've always got one. <laughs> um, Jim alluded to this notion of assisted migration, and Jim, based on your comments, I think you were more or less talking about species. But uh, Jared Grayfield, the author of these models, is a population geneticist that I've worked with for about 40 years. So, and I know Jerry is looking at this uh, assisted migration of populations of the same species. So, believe it or not, there's a seed source study of Tundra pine that's now in its 101 year. So we have 100 years of experience of seed source testing with Ponderosa pine, but lots of other species. And actually, by going downhill, you mentioned, you can get spe you know, populations of the same species that are more adapted to perhaps warmer, drier climates, whatever. So there are very sophisticated ways to try to predict where to go to get the seed to come here for a population that's going to be here in 50 or 100 years or whatever. And so I wonder if the, if, uh, the public in general, or you guys as professionals, would be more receptive to moving populations of the same species than perhaps bringing in new species. So it would allow the critters that live on to have a place to live. So there's something to talk about. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I'll just take a stab at this a little bit. Um, I, I am not a big fan of kind of movement, um, mostly from an insect and, and entomology perspective, only because you may be able to get a species that can persist in an area that might be emergent or based on. Um, temperature regimes or climate regimes, it might be able to persist there. But that subspecies or species that might be less um, kind of favorable now might be in the future, but it's untested to insects and disease, and so we have no idea whether or not we're moving something and creating a, another scenario for our grandkids or for our great-grandkids. And I think we need to be very careful about what we do with plasticity and kind of um, building resiliency in, in our Comment. Um, I rely on those from Forest Health to advise us on that. <laughs> 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 well, I think it's a fascinating issue, of course, with these all have ethical components and so forth, but <coughs> is everyone aware here that when you go up the hill up to the highway here that we have lodgepole pines that oops. You know. They're not in this area, so they're, you know, and they're not a blight on the land, right? Except for some foresters who really want to get rid of them, and for some of us. But anyway, um, but I think it's just, you know, what Dan's talking about. Let's be careful with some of the things. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, what, what Sam's, what, you know, what comes to me with your question, Sam, is, some of our, even our current practices and how are we doing it. For example, um, you know, I'm just being straightforward with information. I'm not being to be um, taking some of these things down, but right now there's some 
spruce salvage operations going on in the southwest corner of the state. So most of those are in Rio Grande and Chima. So the idea is that you go in uh, where the spruce have died from uh, the spruce bark beetle, and you try to salvage as much of that timber as you can while it's still viable. And certainly there's some good reason to that, uh, economic and so forth. But it's good to pay attention to the numbers, which is numbers are something like 60 to 70 percent of the regeneration in that ground is not making it through the logging operation. So that's a fairly significant number. Um, and of course, then in our human wisdom, we're like, well, we'll replant, right? Okay. However, replanting, um, this goes to Sam's question here, we are replanting with, you know, those seedlings are in there. They've evolved for thousands of years in seeds right there. So they got the, you know, they got the DNA smarts right there. So whatever you bring in there is already going to be a little different. Um, and so it's never as good to replant as far as I've, what I've learned and talked to and seen and so forth like that. So it's just all these little components to it. So I think what Dan's point there is, I mean, even that replant from spruce that and this forest is really good. And this forest is very good at finding seed stock, getting them going in the in the nursery and and, and doing that for things as far as uh, areas and so forth. But the next step is a little bit scary as to where we're going to pick them up from and bring them in, but I appreciate the enthusiasm. <laughs> Marcus, do you have a question? Um, sure. I thought you were um, JR, I know you've been at your um, business operation and modeling plan for 10 years or more over in Pagosa, and um, you've been missing a lot of money and time um, in some sophisticated equipment. And um, I like your business model. It's using the whole tree. And early on, you were trying to um, put a plant together to um, produce electricity. And um, I believe, and you, and you can speak in more detail to it, but essentially, um, Tri-State kind of shot you down wouldn't sign the, sign the deal. And um, there's been a lot of discussion in Durango here on whether we go renewable or not. And if we look at um, possibilities of getting out of Tri-State's contract and going for more renewable here locally. So maybe you can speak a little to, if that was to happen, how you could maybe um, help us out with some forest management over in Mendoza. Well, what our business model was, it was we, get, we asked the Forest Service to put out to get a long-term stewardship contract. What we plan on doing in what we're actually currently doing is everything Kansas is large, we pay them by the time for removal of salt logs. But in Kansas, the smaller we, we do down to five inches, we do whole tree chipping, actually in the woods, we chip those trees. Um, you know, right within 50 to 100 feet where they were standing. We bring those chips out and they're still clean because the chip are chipping really rap, they're not skidding across the ground. And what we plan to do is we want the power. Uh, we worked with a lot of electric. Uh, they, it took a couple of years, but they uh, we gave an agreement on a purchase price, a power purchase agreement. Um, a lot of electric and I went and approached Tri State. Uh, Many a times they told us basically how to put the deal together. When the public finally agreed to it, we took it to Tri State, and they, the way they did it is they used their policies and procedures between them and their co op members and just didn't take it to a vote. So they wouldn't let them go in front of the board. So if you asked Tri State, they said, Well, we never voted against uh, biomass power. Well, yeah, but you wouldn't let them come to a vote either. And uh, so we believe, and our agreement with the Blood Life was that we would sell them power at just a very small amount of what they were currently paying to Tri State. Um, but Tri State came back and said, no, not only can you not buy the power, but we'll buy the power and we'll buy it at about 30% of what you guys have offered this company to buy the power. And oh, by the way, we're going to sell it to you and we'll like to get a full rate. And so what's happened over the years is that 
by centralizing the power for tri-state, um, they've also not only done that, but they've used their policy procedures to, pay, uh, to create a monopoly so that tri-state really is to make all the final decisions. So your local co-op can have input, they can, they can agree to certain terms, but the reality of tri-state can always block and provide uh, power that they believe competes with them. And so that's really what our problem is. We've had to downsize our project. Uh, we will be making biochar, we'll be making fire bricks, we'll be still using our 26 to 30,000 tons a year of which is in other forms, but ideally the, the market that we see for Pagosa, Dolores, Durango, and all every little mountain town that has a force that comes down to them is that you can produce between three and a half and five megawatts of power on some biochar, and you can sell it pretty close to the going rate uh, at the local market. Um, but until I, I'm not in a camp that says go buy out of try to say, I think that there just needs to be an open rebellion against uh, all the local co-ops until they change their, their policy procedures. So I think there's a, a way of doing it. It's just going to take those that are paying those electric bills to finally see what's happening and then stand up and say, no, you will change policy procedures. I hope that answers your question. But that's over right. I'm new here, so I don't know if you've already answered this question somewhere else, but you know, probably know the International Scientific Community is kind of having a fit now about the burning of biofuels. As part of that, is a carbon neutral renewable energy source or not? Um, the scientists are basically saying, no, it's not. In fact, here's March 2018 science article that says, our wood pellets are green fuel. Um, the subheading is a return to firewood is bad for forests and the climate. So I don't know what's happening here locally. I don't understand your business model. I don't know anything about the life cycle system here that you're proposing. But is there an analysis that would show us whether burning biomass here locally in the San Juan truly is good for carbon in terms of the carbon cycle? And I'm not going to try and is there a documented source? Yeah, there are people that are researching it, but I think the key, even on the report you're, you're describing, is that if you're uh, if, if you weren't in the forest, sitting in the forest anyway, because you needed to for fire mitigation or uh, watershed protection, if you weren't offsetting it with, with, with the uh, methane releases and everything else going on in the forest, yeah, it probably wouldn't be. But when you look at all the other benefits you're getting and all the other work you're doing on it, uh, and you look at the newer technologies that are out there like gasification, uh, it gets into a neutral side. And, and I've seen scientists debate both sides of that, and I would agree with you that if I was just out uh, randomly taking or clear cutting a forest, that it, it would, but when you look at all the other um, things that you're protecting when you're doing that, I think it would find there's enough scientists out there that say that it is neutral. And you look at the European Union, they, you know, they, they come out that way, they come out that direction. So there is no document that explains your proposal how it is going to be I don't have a document that I can hand to you and say, you know, go, you know, you can hang the Thank you very much. I'd love to just hear a general comment on fire risk and fire opportunity with regard to the force you how many peak time have I driven over Volk Creek Pass and said, oh, this just looks like a fire waiting to happen. Whether or not I'm accurate, I don't know. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that have that reaction. And then there's another kind of point is, the wood fires control in some fashion may be to our advantage. And if that becomes one, I'm just kind of curious. <clears throat>
creating a fire hazard initially with um, the dead beetles. It, it is a, initially a fire hazard, fire gets into the ground and can spread that way. Um, once the fine fuels are off, um, once the needles fall on the ground, you might get a ground fire. And then once all the uh, trees are on the ground, you could have real severe fire that way. Um, but beyond the pine or beyond the spruce, um, the dead spruce, in, in a lot of our pine areas, we have uh, oak understory that we are trying to do something about. Or overstocked um, stands under us of pine needs thinned out. Um, we are we're being very proactive across the San Juan. Uh, we have uh, are in the process of completing environmental analysis for um, district wide on two of the districts and, and about, uh, about 8,000 acres in Columbine. And that's so that when we um, have the opportunity, uh, a window, that we can uh, put prescribed fire on the ground to manage those fuels. So we've identified areas where we can safely um, conduct a uh, prescribed fire to just reduce those fuels so that when we get a lightning caused fire or um, even human caused, that we can reduce the severity of that fire. Um, banning out forests also helps that um, we're also looking at when we do get a naturally caused fire that if it's in the right place at the right time we have the folks it's safe we'll manage that fire as well the only way we're really going to treat large areas um, to reduce fuels is really it's mostly through fire and through managing um, naturally caused fires so I know we have some controversy with smoke in the air for that and um, we've had some discussions on that, but um, at the right time, when it's safe, you may see some smoke in the air, and that may be the Forest Service. In concert, actually, we work um, across boundaries with uh, our other partners, Colorado State, um, BLM, to, to do that, uh, BIA as well, so. I'll just add a little bit uh, from the scientific literature and, and talk a little bit about um, fire behavior in beetle areas. And so there's a couple of papers that have been published about, you know, are we more likely to see fires where there's been bark beetles versus um, where there hasn't? And, and what we found through looking at kind of uh, lightning strikes in lodgepole dominated stands is that there actually is no difference where there's been bark beetles and where there hasn't in the number or the frequency of fire that occurs. That has nothing to do with fire behavior. That's just, are we likely to see more fires in areas where there's bark beetles? And that was 30 years worth of a window that they were looking at, and, and the answer was no. And um, just to kind of add maybe a little bit more to the conversation and play devil's advocate a little bit, there's been some papers that have been published out of Utah State that have shown that, um, you know, when the bark beetles come through, there definitely is this higher fire risk, right, when the needles still retain on the tree. Um, but when the needles have come down, and those one hour and 10 hour fuels are no longer a concern that can um, it allows this light to penetrate on the forest floor. It allows those grasses and forbs to actually grow up and it kind of produces what they refer to in these papers as a wet blanket. They have a higher fuel moisture than um, what would normally be there. And so it can prevent, depending upon when those lightning strikes occur, it can prevent those surface, surface fires from running through the forest um, duff. And so um, I think the the, what we're lacking here is the spatial, or kind of, um, sorry, the, the temporal scale um, that's really important. Are we talking about a red phase of dead mortality trees or beetle cost trees? Are we talking about after the needles have come, come down and it's more of a gray phase? And so um, time since event or time since bark beetle activity is really important when we're talking about fire behavior. And also thinking about when speeds need to carry a crown fire are much, much higher after we've had bark beetles come through because there isn't that contiguous canopy to carry the fire through the ground. So, so I think we've got to be very careful about um, talking about wind speeds and, and flame lengths and talking about is it a catastrophic fire. When those thousand hour fields are large, heavy big trees are down on the forest floor, of course we're looking at much, much higher fire intensity or fire behavior once the fire starts. 
Um, but I, I think it's a difference in question. Are we talking about if a fire were to start, or are we talking about if a fire has started, what are we most likely to see? And uh, I, I don't want to split hairs, it's just kind of a fine point. Anybody else? We got a question way back here. So, uh, a couple of comments and two questions. Uh, first of all, PR, uh, thank you for taking the business risk because there's not too many people out there that would uh, put their capital forward and uh, try to tread through the forest with a uh, blazing trail like that. So, again, thank you. Uh, number uh, two other questions. One is about the WASP project that was released up on the front range. I understand that there was potentially a and imported species to try to combat the beetles. Uh, there was aggressive loss. And number two, uh, Kara, can you speak to the uh, vegetation management plan now that's uh, been done for uh, everything east of Chicago and 501 over to the Pier? Um, the only thing that I can say about the WASP project, um, I know nothing about the WASP project dealing with bark beetles. Familiar with biocontrol projects dealing with animal dashboard, so an exotic invasive species that comes in and uh, moves through our um, urban community. Um, and so that species is, uh, there's really three different species that have been released by USDA APHIS to combat animal dashboard. Um, and, and maybe just a nod, are, are you referring to animal dashboard or, or bark beetles in uh, general? Either one of them, it was a fairly generic comment that was made in one of the fire conferences. Okay, yeah, so I can talk a little bit about the Emerald Ash Board biocontrol releases, and um, basically there are several that um, target different stages of the life cycle, um, but it's really uh, to slow down the spread is really what that biocontrol um, agent is used for. Um, again, this is a species that's exotic, so it's not from here, um, so we were able to kind of, or USDA APHIS was able to um, go to China and figure out what species attack that emerald ash borer in China, and is it highly host specific? So does it pretty much only attack the emerald ash borer? And what they found was that it does indeed, and so we were able to rear those uh, in chambers um, and then release those as a biocontrol agent. It's not 100% effective. Um, it reduces the population by somewhere between 15 and 20%, um, and so we're talking a small portion. It slows it down and gives you an opportunity to treat ahead of the, the storm. And I'll let Kara talk a little bit about the vegetables. So I assume you're talking about um, our Biocito Piedra project over there, and I believe it was about an 80,000 acre analysis area. Um, and it, on the Columbine District, in the, in, in the described the Biocito Piedra area. And I, um, we are finished with that analysis and in the objection period, but what that project is, it's um, Kind of like I described earlier, it's um, we looked at it to put prescribed fire on the ground. Um, so we've analyzed all the resources, identified the areas where we would put fire there. Um, there's some salvage associated with it, um, some salvage sales, and a little bit of thinning with that project. So we um, plan on beginning implementation sometime, probably the next month to start start doing some vegetation management in there. And it's all with the I with the objective of reducing fuels out there and um, creating more resilient more resilient landscapes. So just uh, one follow-up question to that. So will that vegetation management plan substitute for a NEPA uh, study and when as we apply for some of the grants to mitigate private property up there, there's not yeah. a competing uh, NEPA project that we usually get to follow up. We did conduct, that was, we conducted an environmental analysis on that, so we did do NEPA, and we are about finished with that. Um, had maybe one objection on that project. So yeah, it's ready to go. And, uh, you know, a lot of the projects we do, we do in partnership with, with um, state, private, so that uh, landowners on private land can do work on their land as well, and get grants for that. So we work with fire as well. Any other questions? Bill. For Dan West Now, thanks for coming down. Spend so much time working on the on that design field. Could you tell us what you think may happen in the next year or, or several years from that big boundary? I'm sorry to map, there's a lot of things in there. There are a lot of spots. What can happen? 
Um, just to kind of maybe the overview, so um, those that aren't familiar, um, out uh, on the glade or kind of northwest of Durango, um, in pure ponderosa pine type, we've seen, um, starting in about 2011 or 2012, we've seen an increase of a bark beetle that um, we're at the northern range of, in Colorado where, it's, where it exists. It extends all the way south to Guatemala, so um, you know, down there it produces two generations per year in Colorado. We believe that it only produces one generation. Um, and so, you know, what we turn to, I turn to some of the literature and try to figure out what can we find out about this insect and what do we know about it. And basically, it's um, typically found with other organisms, other bark beetles that are in, uh, that are native bark beetles that are in these forests. Um, but what we're seeing down there, uh, kind of on the blade, is really we're starting to see it attacking trees by itself, killing trees by itself. Um, so to, to kind of address your question, you know, we've, we've pretty much seen acreage, um, affected acres only go up since 2011. We're now just shy of 11,000 acres impacted um, on that national pond San Juan uh, in Norris County out there. And um, so, so your question is, you know, what are we likely to see in the next year, maybe two years? Um, from my perspective, in a year like this where we have almost no precipitation, um, it's been so warm. Uh, we have that particular insect, it flies late as an adult, it, it overwinters as it eggs. And then as temperatures are warm enough, it comes out of its egg stage and starts to develop. I see no reason um, currently that there's any impediment for it to continue to, um, continue to move through acreage and continue to um, develop and, and affect more acres in the near future, especially in a year like this where we have very little precipitation. Um, and you know, we can all kind of do the rain games and hope that we get you know, a little bit of precipitation. Um, but I have no reason to believe that it's going to stop now. The trees are stressed and we're going to have trouble resisting Yep, and so, you know, the way the trees defend themselves is basically through resident pitch, and um, in a year like this where there's very little resident, very little pitch, um, and very little resources to, once they are attacked, to induce more resin and more compounds within those residents. Um, these are the years that forest entomologists um, are really cringing, as well as fire professionals are cringing, because trees are highly susceptible in a year like this. And so, um, yeah, we anticipate each one of those pockets. For those that haven't seen the kind of map, there's a, uh, we produce a forest health report, there's maps that are in that forest health report, so you can give it a look right now. But there's many little, what, what I consider to be spot fires or pocket activity of beetles, and I have no reason to believe those are going to continue to grow. Did that answer your question? I think that's the same thing with spruce bean. I mean, said the antics are now crossing over. There's no reason this, all our holiday past, all that's going to be gray. Um, yeah, so at this point, we have no reason to believe that something would be out there to stop it. Um, it's really just a matter of time. So, that area that you just described, and then also through um, making around the rest of you to ask them. Um, it's, it's kind of been picking up a little. We can find it in the area of survey and um, a lot of people are wondering is it going to be the same? And honestly, we feel like just what's stopping it, and especially after years like this, the last year it was phenomenal. It was a But then it's fallen by a drought year, and so we're not quite sure of the thing that will in the next few years. What's the temperature, low temperature of the film? 20 below the surface of the or something? Yeah, that's, it's kind of a, that's like a mid range, so I don't remember that. Uh, I'll have to take a look at that. Yeah, so the temperature range is about 20 below the surface of the film. Yeah, so, so the temperature that's been published for mountain pine beetle is negative 35 below the bark, um, and we we rarely reach that rate. So it takes a couple of days to for ambient temperatures to progress down into the Cambrian layer, and so it gets that negative 35 below zero Fahrenheit. Is, is um, that, those days are gone. So the last time we saw that was in 1985 in the Fraser Valley, which is also known as the ice box of the nation, right? So um, yeah, and when you look at statewide, we have 4.8 million acres of Inglewood spruce fir type, and we've now seen 1.78 million of those acres that have been affected um, in, in the last basically two decades by spruce beetles. We have an outbreak that has really um, started in the southern part of the San Juans and has moved north. 
And we have another outbreak that started up by Steamboat, and it's moved its way all the way around North Park and is now starting to move its way south. It's in Rocky Mountain National Park and kind of moving its way southwest now. And so we have no reason to believe that um, it's, there's any impediment to it. There's a contiguous cruise fight in between both of those outbreaks, um, and we have no reason to believe that um, at this stage there will be a. So the question was, why is it those small trees in? Um, it's really a bark beetle um, kind of a legacy. So they're smart, right? They leave something for their next for their grandkids. Um, but it's really based on their on their biology. So bark beetles live in the phloem layer. The phloem is where the carbohydrates are at inside of a tree. And so the more phloem, the more food there is for their offspring. Um, there becomes a threshold at which their any self-respecting female won't lay her eggs in that part because they're just simply in the phloem. It's a threshold. Great question. So maybe now we, we know the wisdom of the forester who planted lodge poles up 550 <laughs> until that beetle comes along. So um, seriously, I was thinking, if when everyone here, when the next time you go over Wolf Creek Pass, I would encourage you to park the car and go for a walk in the forest. Uh, to see what's there. I think it's pretty interesting. I found it to be um, you know, much more alive and diverse than you might get when you're driving by the road. There's a lot of um, uh, you know, there's a lot of growth under there coming up you just can't see now. The diversity I was surprised by uh, just the species and so forth. So it's, it's kind of a worth the worth the analog road and it's I would say it's, it's kind of more uplifting than the 55 mile drive by. Well, actually, the skiing, the back of your skiing is worse now because it's not the shading. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, so anyway. Uh, I have a question that I would like to pose. I just think, you know, given some of the context we've put, some of the presentation that Jim made, what do you envision the future, our, our, our community's relationship with the forest will look like uh, as we experience these changes? And then, what gives you hope about that relationship? Because we talked a lot about some of the things that, that are, uh, it could be being is pretty dark and depressing, but there's some hope here, right? We're still going to live here. No, no. <laughs> I tell you, you know, your conservation is you don't believe in hope. So that's kind of what you have sometimes. But I, I was just thinking, yeah, thinking about that. Um, I have to say that um, my hope is just really in people uh, working together to find solutions. I have to say that's where I think it's sad it's looking at. Um, you know, I'd say for our organization, the biggest concerns are really uh, we look at you know what's a what we want is all of us want is we want an ecologically functioning watershed. And so that's kind of the bottom line when we think about um, just how we manage or how we engage the forest, all the way from protections to forest management. So um, I guess you know I'm really concerned, and I think the way forward is kind of just working together on pieces and being smart. Uh, I, think, you know, I think that's the way I mean. You know, JR, um, many years ago, <laughs> uh, came and sat down and we started talking about this project. And, you know, there's no doubt there's some pieces of it that, you know, cause me heartburn. And there's some pieces of it that I'm really excited about. But anyway, I mean, the best deal, I think, is that you know, JR is industry, and I'm an environmentalist. But the reality is that we talk through issues, um, concerns, problem solving, with the politics of like all the time. And I like that. I think it's good. You know, an example of that is, and I, I think this is an answer kind of going away, you know, looking forward, deciding where how things things together. So one day I get this call from JR and he's like, Jimbo, I want you to know that I just want, I'm not going to start a large timber operation over here. But this is how I remember at least. But then he said, you know, I just can't see chipping saw logs 
you know, I think it heard it inside somewhere there. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. I worked with a small mill as a kid. And um, so he says, well, I'm thinking about buying a small saw mill, you know, use one, hopefully. And um, so that, uh, you know, because there's some economic benefit, there's a market, um, so we're not shipping everything. And so, anyway, so we had the dialogue about that. And, you know, there's other pieces that have been concerned that have to do with, uh, some things have to do with carbon, that have to do with uh, water consumption and so forth. And we kind of had these conversations with JR over with, uh, with all these pieces. So, as we look ahead at trying to figure out all these pieces, whether the challenges or opportunities, I think it's looking at all, <coughs> Excuse me, looking at all of those pieces and trying to see how they fit together and get, uh, you know, what Karen and your staff have always told about the social and economic and ecological pieces. I go back to the community scale of these projects. For me, it's uh, getting broad buy in on, on the direction you need to go. It might not be perfect, but it's the right direction to get broad community support, but then scaling it to your town so that you're not hauling these products uh, two or three hundred miles. Um, it, it's, it's a lot harder to go this route, but I think that, you know, again, my vision is every little mountain town can solve their own problem in the foresight of which they get broad collective buying. The other thing that gives me hope is that, you know, for the last few years I did a lot of collaborative groups all over the West, uh, calling and saying, well, what are you guys doing out there? You know, what's working, what's not? Uh, you know, we've got the same problem. You know, how do you see us fixing that? But in the last three or four months, what I'm getting calls constantly from is mayors from small towns, community members, um, uh, council members, county commissioners, and it's like a light bulb has gone off in the West and says, hey, we've got to come up with the solutions that will work for our small town. And I get to hope that every Every group now is going to start coming up and saying, okay, this is what's going to work best for us, and this is how we're going to get rid of the product, and here's how we're going to do a true forest restoration uh, project and not uh, you know, limit it to just one part of it. And the other thing that comes to mind is when you come behind some of the areas that we've done work in, it's a lot easier for them, uh, for the Forest Service to come through and, and do burns in those areas, and a little safer. So I think there's a lot of benefits from it, but it does give me hope to see how so many uh, people that are in key positions now are looking out for the solution. Um, I guess uh, one Take a stab at what is our relationship with our forest going to look like, and, um, and maybe finish it up with a little bit of hope. But um, for me, I think that we need to really have a, a cultural shift in making our forest a priority. And I think that's coming along. Um, but I think that for a while there, we had several decades where we felt this intrinsic value that the forests were always going to be there. And we could kind of manage them at more of a slow pace or kind of a um, more of an agroforestry kind of pace, um, you know, utilizing some material, thinking that it's always going to be there. And I think as the wildland urban interface grows and we get more and more people, um, we've really got to focus our management efforts on what is our desired outcomes and what do we want out of the forest. And, you know, I kind of turn to Europe for some of this, right? There's so many people in Europe that they and their forests are so well managed and, and maybe one could argue overly managed. Um, only because, you know, they've had to to retain that resource for so long. 
And I think that we're getting into that cultural shift in, in, in the United States that we're making that a priority. We've seen that some on the East Coast as well. And, you know, just a little touch on kind of what gives me hope. You know, pretty much never in my lifetime have I seen um, kind of the collaborations and work across political boundaries that we have now. Um, you know, I work for the state, my counterparts work, you know, they work for the feds and, you know, we're meeting with collaborations and we're meeting with uh, landowners and, and it's all kind of a focused effort on the resource rather than focusing on, well, this is my turf and this is your turf. And that gives me a little bit of hope. The other things I taught at Colorado State University for eight years and kind of thinking about our next generation and enrollment is up in Metro Resources. Um, we're starting to see, you know, somewhat of a value in that from our young um, generations and generations below me. And, and that really gives me hope as well, thinking that, you know, there are people that are interested in this and they see value in this. Certainly not for the money. I mean, none of us are here to, um, well, not all of us are here to make money. And, you know, some of us got into this for, uh, uh, you know, just because this is our passion and believe that it's um, for the better of all of us. So. Well, I really want to echo some of what's already been said. Um, the San Juan has some fantastic partnerships down here. Um, we work, we work with folks from the state, from you know the environmental side, from the industry, from the counties. Um, we just have groups that that love the national forest. Right? As far as our relationship, I see continued you know desire to do a lot of recreation. And those folks who love recreating on the national forest really want to come to the table and help us. Um, help us with figuring out the problems. And there's a lot of smart people in this community and putting a lot of smart heads together and um, you know, leveraging resources um, just through partnerships, through collaboration, through everybody working together. I think um, I think we can come up with some great ways to, to address the situation. And we do make it sound pretty dire, but it's not necessarily it's like that bad. <laughs> I want to hear from Jim. What, what gives you hope? I think the silver lining all the doom and gloom is lots of salvage opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a wonderful discussion. Does anybody have anything else before? Yes. One more. So I'm curious about the Aspen. Uh, Jim referenced that a little bit about possibly planting Aspen. Uh, Jim, you know, you talked about walking in the forest and what you might see. Uh, one experience that I had at the Missionary Ridge was the emergence of Aspen. So um, what are we looking at as far as that? And what issues might come up? If we're looking at the emergence of the Aspen. Issues if we're relying on the Aspen. That's good for fall tourism, that's what <laughs> Well, there, uh, in, in those fires, a lot of Aspen comes up. Uh, Aspen loves fires. And uh, what I don't know, it, it would be interesting to know how much of it is sprouts from pre existing root systems and how much is actually seedlings because they're you know once people go out and look for seedlings they find lots of them but uh, you know so I, I think that's all good news and uh, even without fire after the spruce beetle um, operates people are and not might be the one north I guess you know people are seeing more aspen stands coming up uh, where those uh, conifers were so that's that's all good, and, and uh, you know, in, in our climate models, although Aspen does have a lot of loss, there's also a lot of emergent, and Aspen is probably best equipped of all the species to colonize that emergent uh, zone because it's uh, it seeds disperse so readily from the farm. So, um, you know, I don't see any special problem for Aspen. It's currently a winter. 
I'd just like to add that a species that's a you know deciduous tree that can be mixed in with coniferous trees can only add resiliency to a lot of those stands thinking long term. And you know, we kind of bring that back to kind of our urban forest, right? We never like to plant the whole block with the whole species. And I kind of look at aspen as that early fauna and I can add in a little bit of that resiliency in the future. Um, and, and we're certainly seeing that in kind of the Gunnison Basin, you know, where we've got Doug Furbeal that's um, you know kind of moving through a lot of those stands and the pockets are now starting to coalesce and we're seeing whole hillsides um, that are you know succumbing to beetle activity. And so you know, if we can promote aspen in some of those areas, I'm all for it because it basically gives us some, you know, erosion control that basically gives us a little bit of resiliency for future forests as well. So I, I, I like Jim. I'm all, all for adding in as much resiliency as we can. I first see pretty falls in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just throw in one little piece here. So once again, I really encourage people to go out and poke around the forest. And there's so much fascinating you know, we're such a transitional time in the forest right now. It's just very interesting. For example, if you go up by the sea though, towards where the Pine River takes off and to the north facing slopes and see how the aspen is taken off there. Um, you know, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that I saw some con conifers underneath there already smiling uh, that they're going to get some shade here in their early days, you know. So except if you're a elk or deer trying to get through some of this new dog hair um, aspen, there's just a lot of so I mean they're so they're so adaptive. And I think the other piece, you know, is where we're losing out these south facing slopes. You don't have to go very far to see where they're emergent. Um, you know, they're just they really get after it. Um, the one other piece on the market side that's really interesting is I think we all know that Western Excelsior plant um, it it's fire, but uh, the fellow who's picking up the Western Excelsior operation over there, um, maybe it's not public knowledge, it's not all aware, but looking at it, he told me the other day that uh, you know, West, the Excelsior is a product that people are very interested in, and fortunately it's a, you know, a quick-growing species, and as Jim pointed out here, it's, it's going to be a happy species, and it's going to be around, and it is good for fall tourism. Excelsior. So Excelsior is shredded, finely shredded uh, aspen that uh, it looks, I think it was the predecessor to little plastic cellophane for Easter egg baskets, right? Um, so it's just like finely shredded uh, aspen and it's used for erosion control and packaging and panels for uh, uh, swamp coolers and has a lot of fun uses for it. Great. This has been a wonderful discussion. I want to thank our panel for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you.